Tonight I issue a challenge to the nation. Every state should adopt high national standards. In fact, 49 states have already developed their own education standards, blueprints for quality. We need to compare how our students are doing with other states and with other nations. And if, if we set up good standards and good assessments, I will know how I'm investing my money. One argument for national education standards is consistency. Americans move a lot. We have about a 50% mobility rate. We lose about 25% of our students in the school year, and we gain about 25% new students. But what if standards of educational quality already exist, and the adults in charge do not respect the schools that achieve them? We are fighting for our kids to go to this school to get a good education. This is not the first time that schools have been closed. They don't know that to take this school away is like taking life away from a lot of these kids in this neighborhood. We are closing buildings. We are not closing down programs. This program is about standards. Should our schools have higher standards? What are the rewards for reaching those standards? We're calling this program Elementary Confusion. But as you will see, it is not the students who are confused. The Merrill Report, Elementary Confusion, is brought to you by the people of Toyota. And by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Ford Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. We have two stories to tell you about standards in education. For the past two years, we've been following some first, second, and third graders. We've watched them learn. We've watched their teachers help them try to reach the school's standards. We've seen the adults make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And we've watched the system. This school has high standards. Green Holly Elementary School is in Lexington Park, Maryland. In the fall of 1995, we began keeping track of 14 second and third graders curious to see how much math they would learn. At the beginning, of course, they could not answer questions about material they had not studied. We questioned the second graders. What is two times two? Three. How much is two times two? Zero. What is 100 minus 33? 73. How much is five times five? Is, I don't know that one. I don't know uh, times yet. How much is five times six? 36. How much is six times five? I don't know those. Then we tested the third graders. What's 10 times 63? I don't know. What is estimating? I don't know. Which is bigger, a whole half or half of a whole? Um, whole half. What is regrouping? Uh, I think I forgot. You like put, like, stuff in groups. What's 10 times 63? Hard one. If I gave you six quarters, how much money would you have? Mm -hmm. $1.75. What is a glyph? A glyph? I don't know what that is. When we went back in December of 1995, the second graders were making progress. How much is 3 times 5? 15. How much is 10 take away 3? 8. What's 3 times 3? 12. 3 times 3. 6. How much is 5 plus 5 plus 1? 11. The third graders were also making progress. What is regrouping? Regrouping is when you have to Borrow, kind of like borrowing. 
What's 10 times 62? 6,062. 3 times 5? 15. If I gave you 7 quarters, how much money would you have? A mm dollar -hmm. and 75 cents. So how much is 3 times 5? 16. How much is 10 times 62? 100. What's 10 times 64? 640. In the spring, more progress. If I gave you six quarters, how much money would you have? $1.50. What's five times five? 25. Which is bigger, a half of a whole or a whole half? A whole half and a half a whole is the same. Five times five. Fifty. What's six times five? Thirty. You use this one 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 way and the same way as the other, but you just switched it around. Sort of a trick question, huh? The third graders were also doing well. What's five times six? Thirty. What's five times seven? Uh, thirty-five. Five times eight? Forty. What's a glyph? Like, um, something like you have all these, all these, like, eyes and noses. A glyph is like, you go like this. The mouth means if you're a boy or a girl. The triangle nose means if you know all your multiplication tables. When you pass multiplication, you can put the hair, curly hair. And if you didn't, you can put mohawk. It's like a picture. What's estimating? I forgot what that was. If I gave you six quarters, how much money would you have? A dollar and fifty-six. If I gave you seven quarters, how much money would you have? A dollar and seventy-five cents. If you had a dollar seventy-five and I took three quarters away from you, how much would you have left? A dollar. At the end of the school year, all the children were eager to display what they'd learned. Tell me what regrouping is. Um, you can't take zero away from five. You cross it to five, make it a ten, scratch it out, and put the number on top. A hundred take away forty-five is? Fifty-five. And you borrowed and carried and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. What's twenty-five divided by five? Five. What's a fraction? It's like this. It's a square that you can just do and you shade it in. And then you just equal it one-fourth. What's five times five? Five is... Twenty-five. What's five times four? Twenty. What's five times six? Thirty. How do you write that fraction? What do, how do you say that fraction? One-fourth. What's six times six? Thirty-six. What's five times seven? Four. Thirty-five. What's seven times eight? Fifty-six. What's eight times seven? Fifty-six. How come they're the same? You just switch them around. <laughs> What's estimating? A number that's about a number. What's 100 take away 45? You can write it down if you like that. Twelve divided by four. Three. How'd you get that so fast? Um, three, times, three times four equals four. Aha. 
What's seven times eight? Fifty-six. Fifty-five. So a hundred take away forty-five is fifty-five. Oh, I see a good start. Tom Simpson taught the second graders. He lives here. He lives here. I walked over to my closet and I pulled out my shirts and my ties and I, I, I just couldn't decide on which one to wear. So I had to walk all the way down to the office. It's good that I think about my job almost every minute I'm awake and in some form, whether I'm eating or driving, I'm thinking about what, what I can do to motivate them. <laughs> hey, that's easy. And she said, you know, you have too many combinations to choose from. You have three shirts here and three different ties. Two times five, Brian. I need a number. What is it? It's ten. Ten, so if I decided to multiply, well then, hey, I'm already back up to the raft. I'm swimming again. <laughs> I just like for them to realize that it doesn't all have to be uh, boring it, as long as we're learning and having fun at the same time, whether it be like making a, a funny story to start the lesson, whatever it may take to get them motivated. Raise your hand if you think that's 345. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes it, it is. is. Oh, yes, it is. No, that's 915, isn't it? No. Right here? No! Oh, oh. Yeah. I'm glad you guys are here. They like catching you making mistakes. They love catching me making mistakes. And that's something that keeps them, at, you know, attending to what I'm doing. And they love doing it. If I get the wrong answer every day and they know it, that's fine. So you don't stand on your dignity? Or... Oh, no, no. Uh, my dignity is at the end when, when they know what I would like them to know. He has such a great sense of humor with the children. Uh, he's just thoughtful, relaxed around them, they can relate with him, and they perform beautifully. Darlene Barnes taught the third graders. She is the ultimate professional. She works with those students, they respect her, she respects them, she has standards set in her classroom, and those children are aware of those standards, and because they respect her so much, they try to meet those standards. Okay, we have computer lab and gym today. We will do more division. We'll make clay models of elements and compounds for science. Journal, frog story, math log. Use an example to explain how to play division. I had the sense as I looked around your room that you ask more of third graders today than certainly when I was in third grade or even when my kids were in third grade. Mm -hmm. That's because they're asked more when they go in fourth grade. You have to get them prepared for the upper grades. and. Um, more is expected from kids now than when I taught 10 years ago. Jamal, who was the customer? Who was the banker? Me. Okay, where are your hundreds? Is this all you needed for that one? Let's put it back out here. I saw stuff on the boards um, from economics, opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't used to be in third grade. No, but we need that now. All we need here is a what? One line, that's all we need. Can I, draw it? I suspect you have some third graders who know stuff that their fifth grade sibling. But when we talk at the beginning of the school year, I said, when you go home, you tell your sister and brother that we're doing economics or uh, we're doing uh, physics or chemistry and see what they have to say about that. <laughs> so they like that. Darlene Barnes, Tom Simpson, and the other teachers at Green Holly use a curriculum called Roots and Wings, which provides daily lesson plans. Roots and Wings also insists on regular testing. It's giving you information on how are you doing. I mean, like if you run a small business, you'd want to know, you know, are we making money this month? Are we not making money this month? Which of our product lines are working, which are not? You'd be crazy as a, as a small business owner not to be looking for that kind of information. You'd go broke in a, in a, in a year. Uh, and, you know, a school needs to be thinking along very similar lines, that they need to know on a routine basis, uh, on objective measures, whether they're achieving the goals that they're trying to achieve as a school, as individual classrooms, as individual children. Yes. Children who fall behind get immediate help. There are adults that can't stand math, so you know how a student would feel about that. Um, 
children need something to to make them feel like they're not doing a chore. Um, and that's what I try to do. When you come in here, I want you to feel that it's a learning center, it's a learning environment, but we're going to do it the fun way. Eight times four equals, Matt, is that correct? Yeah. We have a winner, oh. Jamal, <laughs> wonderful. I think with Matt and Vincent and Jamal, um, I know they didn't like math. And I know they felt that um, it was something they could not learn. It's fun because they don't realize that they're learning and they're still able to laugh. They're still able to move around. They don't have to worry about that pencil and paper. That's fun. We're trying to get schools to be thinking about, you don't just come to work, do your best, you know, go home and hope it worked. Uh, you, you're thinking about trying to be absolutely sure that you've done absolutely everything that you possibly can to see that every kid's going to succeed from the beginning of their time in school. Chris, Kayla, Leland, and the other second and third graders met their school's high standards. Would that learning continue? We went back to Green Holly a year later, in June 1997, to find out. There are four green balloons, there are five blue balloons, there are eight red balloons, and five pink balloons. And you reach in, you can't see inside and you bring out one balloon, which color are you most likely to get? Red. Why? Because there's eight of them, and there's um, four, four and five of the other ones. Which one has three-fifths shaded in? This one. Explain. How come? How do you know? Because one, two, three, four, five, and it got three shaded in. Three shaded in. Excellent. Which dotted line is a line of symmetry. Because it's equal. Thirty-three. Five dollar bill. Five. Two dollars. quarters. Three nickels, four pennies. How much money did you find? Which of those figures can have a line of symmetry? Correct. What is a line of symmetry? Um. What does it do? Who's dumb? Folds the shape together. Folds the shape together. Yeah, can you draw one? $5.69. Jennifer, Ashley, Leland, Chris, Kayla, and Vincent did well. But where were Jamal, Jake, Tabitha, and the others? The fall of 1995, we started with 14 of your children, seven from your class, mm -hmm. seven from your class. Today, as the second year is coming to an end, only six of those kids are still here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eight are gone. Six remaining. Yeah. Is that That's normal? normal. Yeah. That's normal. We have about a 50% mobility rate. We lose about 25% of our students in the school year, and we gain about 25% new students. Um, it's typical for us to have three to seven new entries in one week and lose as many students the same week. This year I had the same 26 kids for 110 days. And I know that because it was such a novelty having that same group for so long. And then I lost four within a week and then got three within a week. Uh, and then with 10 days left of school, I got one just mm -hmm. recently. And, and they will come at almost any time. And the teachers were very gracious when they see me bring another student to their doorway, you know, new student. They're very accepting. It's just become part of who we are. A lot of that's connected to the military, but not all mm -hmm. of it. Um, some of our uh, population is also transient. Um, we do have some homeless shelters in our area so that the children will be with us temporarily and sometimes move on to another school within the county and then they might move back to us a month later. We've seen some children two, three times in the same school year. Transfers in and out of this naval base make Green Holly's mobility rate higher than normal. But mobility is a problem that just about every school faces. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 
One in five families, 20%, moves every year. We were able to track down three of the eight students who had moved away. Jake Giannini and his family moved to Middleburg, Florida when his father was transferred to the Jacksonville Naval Base. Jake was a third grader at Tynes Elementary School. See those boxes? Which one of those three boxes has three-fifths shaded in? A. Which dotted line is a line of symmetry? It's B. Tabitha Law and her family moved to Yorktown, Virginia, when her father was assigned to the Norfolk Naval Base. Tabitha was a fourth grader at Tab Elementary School. Okay, cannot do that, cannot do that, cannot grab bar for one. Zero. Make that a nine. Make that a nine. Ten, five, one, three, three dollars and fifteen cents. Jamal Parker and his mother, Tanya, moved to Landover Hills, Maryland, so that she could go to college. Jamal, now a fourth grader, went to Glen Ridge Elementary School. Which one of those figures can have a line of symmetry? Yeah. Correct. Why do you say that? A line of symmetry is, is how you can divide something Which to make two halves. To make two halves. Do, will you draw the line of symmetry for that? All right. Can you draw another line of symmetry in that figure? Can you draw another line of symmetry in that figure? Can you draw one more line of symmetry in that figure? Good for you. Wow. Jamal, Jake, and Tabitha seem to have studied and learned the same material as their former classmates. Perhaps elementary school students everywhere study the same math. What kind of coherence, if any, is there in second grades or in third grades, as far as you can tell? Oh, uh, I think we're basically working on the same material, but in different ways. Would it make sense to have second grade studying area and perimeter? no matter where they were. You're talking, yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. I think that would be fantastic if they did that all the way across the board. So we all are working on the same, same material. Exactly. And I think that um, across the country, basically um, with the math books, I think the, the content is basically the same. So we content. already have a national curriculum? Mm, not, I guess you can't call it national, but it depends on what you're using. But basically, the texts are all geared on the same levels. For mathematics. For, for, for math. Yeah, for, for math. The material is the same, but the standards are different. Think of it this way. A quart of milk is a quart of milk in Oregon, Florida, and Maine. You can count on it. But an A in one school might be a B somewhere else. Wandering standards make it difficult for teachers. Do you find that you get a kid coming in from Florida or California, and this, that child's record says, oh, she's a B-plus student, and she doesn't know anything? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. Definitely. And you're looking at gaps from one school to another. I mean, we're, we're all slightly different from teacher to teacher. We'll sometimes teach things at different times in the year, depending on what, it, what that particular thing may be. But when a child goes from one school to another, they may do something entirely different. You're trying to fill in the gaps as fast as possible because there's only a limited amount of time that you're going to see this child. I was talking to a, an elementary school principal in Washington, D.C. She has kids who come in different times of the year. She's absolutely appalled by the difference in standards. She'll get a kid who's coming in and the school will say, this is our best student, and the child won't be able to read. She'll get a kid who's a first grader and say, well, he's, he's okay, and he'll be reading. Is there any kind of standard out there? But that's not only uh, across the country. That could be in a school. Mm -hmm. That can even be in a school, the standards. What do you mean? Well, a teacher might consider one, uh, one standard higher than another teacher might consider a standard. Your A is my C, yes. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. so it's that's, that way in college, too. Yeah, There's, so that's I mean, not only across the country. That can even be in a school. 
we already have a, an agreed upon body of knowledge, area and perimeter in the second grade, that sort of thing. But we have widely varying standards. Yes, yes, for different levels of what's accepted. Parents have also noticed differences as they've moved from place to place. Jack Giannini is Jake's father. It would be a lot easier if we can, just because people want to move every once in a while, to move from one location to another, another and not having kids miss anything. Or if they go from one fourth grade class to another fourth grade class, if they repeat some information, that, that's good. But if they have a standard curriculum, this way, I know if we move from one school to another, he wouldn't miss too much of any particular subject area. Scott Law, Tabitha's father, believes that what works for his employer, the U.S. Navy, would work for schools. I think we ought to have certain standards. So all schools would be the same, just like us moving around the way we do. The same job I do here, where I could go around the West Coast, do the same job over there, San Diego, Alameda, Bremerton, Washington, wherever they might need me. For Carla Law, the differences have been frustrating. I wish I could move from one school to another and it's going to be the same thing as where I left without, well, this standard's this way at this place and this one's at this way at this place and I just wish it was the same all over. Making things the same all over means setting standards. Think about that for a moment. Setting standards implies that quality counts. That is, implicit in the concept of high standards is a promise that if you reach those standards, you get rewarded. It sounds like common sense, doesn't it? Maybe not. Seven years ago, this school could not meet its district's educational standards. Richardson Elementary sits among housing projects in Northeast Washington, D.C. Jobs are scarce here. Crime is rampant and drugs are everywhere. Richardson was a failing school. Looking for help, it turned to a Yale University psychiatrist, Dr. James Comer. Children are born learning. They enjoy learning. They want to find out all about their environment. Uh, in 1990, Richardson's staff and teachers adopted Dr. Comer's approach, which he calls the School Development Program. I believe that learning is a part of growth and development. And if you can create conditions in school where you attend to all aspects of their curiosity, and help them learn how to manage all aspects of what's going on around them, you are helping them learn. In reading, the proposed national standard is that every child should be able to read by the end of third grade. Could Richardson meet that standard? In the fall of 1995, two first grade teachers at Richardson invited us to watch them teach reading. In October, the first graders could not read, but they were willing to try. That's because it's something that you've never seen before, but I still want you to try reading it for me. Go. A little girl is running in the leaves. Thank you for reading that page. My mother holds my hand. I'm taking, I'm cutting the grass. I'm going. So that is reading for them, but it's reading on that level, on a picture reading level. It's still reading, but later on he's going to move to another level of reading. But your goal is reading from the world. Your goal is reading from, right, exactly, that's the goal. But the goal now is just to get them to read, to be, in other words, to get them to feel confident that they can read anything that I put in front of them. I have a baby stand. Kind of worried about Letitia this year just because she tends to write a lot of things backwards. It's common for first graders to write B's and D's backwards, numbers backwards, but I'm really gonna have to work with Letitia. I'm really worried about her. She can't read. No, not at all. The first graders tried again in December 1995. What do you see? I see a little girl. You see a little girl running. Where is she? Outside. What are they doing? Raping. Right All right. They what? They rape. Rape. And, and rape. Very good. Punky. Punky. Any other words you know on the page? 
put, put on, on her, her coat, coat and, and run outside. Good. Hello. Hello, Mr. Vincent. Now I want you to I want you to read this story to me. First of all, are there any words that you know on this page? So that they rate and rate. Very good. Shanika's doing much better. She she wants to read. She has the will that wanting to read, and that's very important in the beginning stage in teaching someone how to read. When you see that in them, that pulls me out even a lot more when I see that there. Ms. Brinson, can I read this? And that pulls me out a lot more, and it makes me feel good that they want to read. Brown, bell, ball. Say it again. Brown, bell, ball. What's this word up here? That can't be bear because it doesn't have a B with it. Oh, very good. My brown bear bar. Good, Leticia. Uh -huh. My red umbrella. Good. And my b. Bike. Our old doll child. Adar is um, very intellectual, very smart. So he's reading. Mm hmm But at a you know, at the level we are on right now in first grade. But it's really decoding yes. the sounds, uh -huh. figuring yes. the words out. Mm -hmm. What we call reading. <laughs> He's reading, but, you know, some people, you know, if you, some people would say, you know, if they throw some words out in front of them, he, you know, you'd have to help him. And, you know, this word rhymes with what sounded out. I mean, you're going to have to coach it, first grader. I mean, but yeah, he's reading. Give me something else that begins with a P. What else? Penny? To teach reading, veteran teacher Johnny Brinson uses a traditional approach called phonics. Phonics is the method in which children learn consonant and vowel sounds first, so that they can sound out words. The idea is that if a child can read the word cat, he can probably figure out pat and bat and mat. Is phonics part of your teaching? Yes, it is. It's, it's a natural part of my curriculum, my curriculum. Phonics has somewhat, um, it, they're into more whole language now to bring in everything in. Now, phonics is not, phonics still is a part of the reading curriculum, but they don't talk about it that much, but it's definitely a part. Whole language is the approach used by second year teacher Ann Reeves. It's the method the school district recommends. Whole language favors creative writing and getting students to talk about spelling and word sounds. For instance, in a whole language lesson about cats, Students would read about cats, write about cats, talk about cats, and perhaps even bring a cat into class. Whole language supporters say that makes students more comfortable with learning, rather than getting them bogged down with language rules. There's always been a huge argument about phonics versus a kind of right. look, say, memorization, recognize the shapes. Do you lean one way or the other? I am more for the whole language program. Um, I bring in my own, we don't have a phonics workbook, um, but I do my own phonics. The book has it all laid out for you, but um, I reinforce it as much as I can, as much as I can. But um, the children, they're doing well with the whole language. I like the whole language a lot better. When we checked with the students again in March 1996, they seemed to be making progress. Go. Punky spends the day breaking leaves. Pucky put on her coat and ran outside. Grampy, wait for me. Very good. Turn. Goodness, these leaves are heavy. Surprise! Very good. Pucky spends the day breaking leaves. Pucky put on her coat and ran outside. Grampy, wait for me. Good, keep going, very good, uh-oh. Goodness, these leaves are heavy. Surprise! Surprise. Very good. 
my mother, my little brother, my yellow basket, my red umbrella. Uh, my red what? Umbrella. Uh huh. And my brown bear one. My red umbrella and my brown bear one. And my brown bear bond. Good job. My boots. Ooh, that was nice. And my brown bear bond. Where's the word brown in that sentence? Very good, thank you. Were they actually reading? Or had they memorized a familiar book? At the end of the school year, we asked the first graders to read a book they had never seen before. Go. Matt, Matt, Pax, Cass, and, and... That's a picture, and they have a picture, and it's something you dig up dirt with a... Sh Shabble. Good. The kids dig in the sand at the pool. What do you do? Where are they? Pond. Pond. Very good, Markel. Markel, you are doing an excellent job. Keep going. The frog is in the net. Very good. Net kick the same. Very good. Very good. The Keep going. ant ran to the well. net map. The net. Tips, right. Tips, Matt, is said the fall is in the pond, said Matt. Very good. Frogs like ants. The ants run to the same. The frogs say rub it. Very good, Tamia. Give me another one. Give me another one. One more. One more. Very good. Anthony, you ready? Okay. Let's read the title. I gotta read the title. What is it? The Field Trip. Very good. The Field Trip. They're going on the Field Trip. Matt. Matt. Pax. 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 Luck. Cans. And. Sh 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 shovels. Shovels. And, and sacks. Man, man. Packs. packs. Now don't cover the word with your finger. Man packs picnic kits. kits. The kids. kids dig in the sand at, at the park. Um. Pond. Very good. Yeah, pond. A frog is in the pond. Ants. Ants. Wow. On the sand. Matt kicks. There's us on the end. Matt kicks the sand. Nick kicks the Sand. Nick what? Kicks the sand. Thank you. Let the let tips tips and what's his name? What's his name? Matt is, is said. Matt is said. It. What is it? Born and aunt aunt is. is on Nan. Matt. Nan. Her name's Nan. Matt. Matt. Sits. On. On. The. It runs with hand, but it's. Sand. Mm-hmm. Nick. Nick. Sit. With. With. Matt. Matt. Very Nick. good. There's a real difference between yes, the pond. way the kids read the 
Johnny's kids read better than Ann's kids. You said to me that you felt that you were partly responsible, that it wasn't entirely Ann's, Miss Reeves' fault. Exactly. Uh, and I, I wouldn't put blame at all on Miss Reeves because as the instructional leader in the building, uh, when I was uh, doing the observations, I was actually seeing direct reading instruction mm -hmm. taking place. However, now, you know, it brings to attention that I was not really seeing that phonetic base. But because of the uh, whole language experience, um, I had not actually focused in on the, the phonetic area as I knew uh, should be a basis for instruction. Upset by failure, Principal Marlene Guy and the staff took action. First of all, we did school by phonics. Uh, because I was very disturbed uh, that some of our children had not mastered the uh, skill of reading as I felt as though they should have. Uh, we did a building-wide uh, phonics program. Richardson had gotten off track in reading. Letitia and several other first graders had not learned to read. Could the school get back on track? A year later, in June 1997, we asked Letitia, now in Mr. Brinson's class, to try to read a book she had never seen before. The snowy no day. The snowy day. Good. This is a good story. <laughs> One winter morning, Peter woke up and looked out the window, saw what? snow. Snow. Uh, fail. No, no, we gotta do fall. It's fall right. It, fall in. Fall in. Fall in. Fall in. Falling done. No, fallen. Snow fall had in. fallen. Down. During. 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 The night. During the night. It covered. Covered. Everything of far. Far. far of us. He. Could see. Last year, Letitia couldn't read, but now? What I, what I start Letitia off with is learning her sounds. I note that she had um, her phonetic ear, did not hear. It seemed like she didn't have it, the, the phonetic skills to read. So I started her off teaching her the phonetic sounds, but doing a little uh, first grade reading and letting her go at her own pace. <laughs> into the snow. He walked with his toys. To his party's to toes. 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 Popping. You got an N in it there. Pop point, point. Point. Pointing. Pointing out like this. She has really improved in her phonetic sounding out, sounding out words. I'm really proud of her. Street. 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 Street to make a path, path for walking. What does that mean? I mean, he was trying to make a path. Well, the snow to, was piled up very high by, along the street. But he tried to make the room yeah. so somebody it's, could get by. Yeah, she can understand what she has read, and that's you can she see it in her while she's reading. She is so happy about reading now. What's it like to be able to read? Kind of fun. Can, like when you walk on the street and everything, can you yes. read the signs now? Yes. Just say stop or one way. Uh -huh. So you can read all that stuff. Yeah. Letitia and the other children who had not mastered reading last year were now readers. Keep in mind that our national goal is to have all students reading by the end of third grade. That means these children are a year ahead of that proposed national standard. Richards and teachers were doing their job. And as happens in good schools, Richardson's staff had identified a problem and fixed it. Richardson is a good school in other ways. It ties the neighborhood together by bringing parents and the community into the school. Parents work here as aides, playground supervisors, and security. The school has an adult learning center where parents can earn their GEDs. More than 30 have so far. Local businesses support Richardson, donating everything from food to computers. The school has an on-site social worker who meets with students, parents, and teachers. The standards the District of Columbia uses to measure school quality, test scores, 
provide more evidence of Richardson's success. Its students score at or above national norms in nine of 14 measures in reading, math, science, and language arts. By contrast, within walking distance of Richardson are two other elementary schools. Their test scores are well below national norms. All three schools had empty classrooms. To save money, one of the three schools had to be closed. How did you find out they were going to close this school? Who told you? Because my teacher said the note and I read it. Oh, so you read the note to... To my mother. And that's how I found out that the school was closed. Did you know it was coming? Did you fear it was coming? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, officially, uh, we heard it over the news. I knew it was going to come on the news at 10 o'clock. But I called Miss Guy, the principal, just to hear it from her first before I get the initial shock on the uh, television. The pain of children, staff, community, and just trying to find out why. We had a short period of time. We were presented as trustees with uh, 18 schools on which we had to have hearings and take a vote. Dr. Bruce McClory, an economist, is chairman of Washington's Emergency Board of School Trustees, created by Congress in 1996 with orders to clean up the district's failing public school system. Congress also told Dr. McClory and the new board to close under-enrolled schools to save money. We asked Dr. McClory to explain the decision to close Richardson. It's very hard to see, but in here, the, the arrow points to Richardson, and within a very short walking distance of Richardson are two other elementary schools, both of which are the receiving schools for the children who are going to be leaving Richardson. And the teachers are going with them, by the way. I think that's a very important point. We are closing buildings. We are not closing down programs. I don't know how one can expect to lift children out of a program, a, a building that has been developed, that has been nourished, and place them in another setting and expect programs to continue. Is there some evidence you looked at that says, yes, you can transplant programs? Uh, no. The answer, I mean, I have not specifically looked at whether you can transplant programs. So this is an, a lab experiment? <laughs> it is not designed as a lab experiment. We would not have gone into this to prove uh, a research point. We went into this because the schools across the district need the resources that are being wasted in school space that is kept open unnecessarily. One reason we were closed is because they said that our classrooms are not full. It's not because they aren't full, it's because we choose not to overload the classroom. Oh, these children are going to these other two, two schools and they'll be put in classes with 30 to 40 children. How can they teach them? You had a, a community here and we all cared about our students and, and if something is going good, why break it up? Facility repair, that was an issue as well? It, it clearly is an issue. Uh, there was not a lot of difference between the expected cost of fix-up of these three buildings, but the fact was that Richardson, of the three, I think it was something, and the estimate was something like three and a half million dollars to fix that up and make it a functioning building. The others were th around three million. So half a million dollars is half a million dollars. I know that figure's not correct, and I am not an engineer. For example, we have no wooden doors. One school that the kids are going to needs a new boiler. The other school, the control valves are not properly working. We had new boilers put in April of 96. We do not have any roof leaks. Uh, that's going to take some money off right then. It seems like the school that's doing great academically, they want to shut us down, knock us down. Uh, the other schools that are not doing so great, Look like they're giving, they're, keeping them, they're, they're boosting them up. up. You said there was no formal uh, educational analysis that you know of. I, I did one. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just a reporter, so you know, <laughs> if I can do it, probably anyone can. But yes. If you look at um, the reading, math, language arts, and science, the right. percentile scores in second grade, third grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. Um, and these are which schools? These are Richardson, yeah, right. Drew, Shad. Right. Richardson, Drew, Shad. In right. blue, I highlighted the ones that had the the school that had the best score. Right. There are 14 mm -hmm. cross and comparisons, you, yeah. and Richardson is first in 13 out of 14. 
Let me ask you. Well, let me ask we oh, just you, to okay. use a number here. For example, okay. in math, uh, Richardson's right. third graders are in the 73rd percentile. Drew's third graders are in the 37th percentile. Shad's are in the 36th percentile. Um, you can pretty much yes. go across the board. In language arts, Richardson's second graders are in the 59th percentile. Shad's are in the 29th percentile. Um, science. This, do you know what, what year this is? Because yeah, this is 19. This is the most recent year. Uh, the most, most recent, recent year, year available to me. Exactly. And to you. Right. That's 90, 90, 96, perhaps. I offered the data. I showed the comparison data, but it just didn't seem to matter. I know that I was aware of exactly what you are pointing out. That we that we have better test scores in Richardson than we had in the two potential receiving schools. That that I was well aware of before I took the vote. And uh, I took the vote, I made my vote, and the majority uh, made its vote knowing or uh, with that information in front of us. Can you take me inside the deliberations? Did, did anybody on your board say, hey, wait a minute, this is crazy. Richardson is an excellent school. Let's move the kids to the excellent school. Uh, I do not recall that particular point being made with respect to, say, Richardson, because we believe that programs can, in fact, be moved. My question to you is, do you think that they are better academically because they are physically in a building called Richardson? Is that what explains those better scores? No, it does not. It, has the, it is the teachers and the principal who have built a, uh, a team and a spirit of education that has produced those results. So you and have the team and you have the spirit in this building. Well, it happens to be in this building. That is correct. And, but that principle is not going to vanish from the face of the earth. That principle is going to be transferred somewhere and do a comparable job somewhere else. And those teachers are explicitly going with those kids to Shad and Drew. At least that's my understanding. You're leaving. I am going to do some other things, yes. I had thought about retiring. I'm considering moving back to South Carolina. So you're not gonna, going to go to those other two schools? No, I'm not. So you don't want your kids to go There's to Drew or Absolutely no way and that I, I would send my child to Drew or Shad. I would take her home and, and teach her at home first. I have two that are in private school already. And the rest of them are looking to go elsewhere. In a time when the country is tying itself in knots about the quality of public education and the desire for standards, sort of mind-boggling to, to be presented with a decision that's made largely on the basis of geography and yeah. physical plan. Okay. But somehow but the, the, the good school yeah. gets closed. Uh, let me, <laughs> the answer to that is that either you accept or do, or do not accept that we are closing buildings and not programs. And they don't know that to take this school away is like taking life away from a lot of these kids in this neighborhood. We were under pressure to close a certain number of schools, right? I mean, and under pressure is the key phrase. We did not, I would not say that we had done the perfect job. I would argue that there's no way of doing a perfect job in this kind of a set of circumstances. My opinion is that it was like a strategic plan, if I may, where you look at an aerial view and you just say, okay, why not that one? Most Richardson families could not afford to move or send their children to private school. So in the end, 249 of Richardson's 330 children enrolled at Drew and Shad, including Ms. Reed's three children. Ms. Harvey, however, enrolled her daughter in another district public school. Letitia's at Drew, which is where Johnny Brinson is teaching. However, the majority of Richardson's teachers did not go with their students to Drew or Shad. They went to teach elsewhere, or they retired. Principal Marlene Guy now works at a public school in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Today, Richardson Elementary School, a good school, stands empty, shut down. That fact says more about our commitment to educational standards than a thousand speeches, proclamations, or slogans. Our country seems to be embracing state and national education standards as if they would somehow solve our school's problems. Some of the arguments for consistent standards make sense, but there's no point to investing another dollar or another ounce of mental energy in developing educational standards if the people in charge are not going to reward the schools, teachers, and students who meet them. To find out more about this program, 
visit us at PBS Online at the internet address on your screen. A production of Learning Matters Incorporated and presented by South Carolina ETV. The Marrow Report, Elementary Confusion, was brought to you by the people of Toyota. And by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Ford Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. For a free companion guide or to purchase a video cassette of this program, call 1 800 553 7752 or write to the address on your screen. This is PBS.